Good morning, Christian Hill. How are you guys doing today? How are you doing today, Linda? I am doing great, Morgan. This is Morgan. awesome. I am so excited <laughs> for right now. I'm not sure you really wanted me here. I did, I did, did but I'm like scared at the same time because for those at home, this is Linda. Yep, and it's me. Linda Woo! might throw something at me if I say the no, wrong I'm thing. Close enough now. Well, I she can... can hit me. Yeah, that's what. That, I am so <laughs> I'm nervous right now. Sorry, please forgive me at home. I'm a little nervous about this, how this is going to go, because I might get hit on TV. Well, it won't be that bad. No. Not yet. <laughs> Depends on what you say, I guess. Alex, is that true? Yeah, if I say all the correct things, then <laughs> <laughs> there's that. Yeah. And uh, just so you guys know, Benny's on location testing out BLTs and grilled cheese sandwiches somewhere this week. <laughs> and so Benny does a lot of cooking, and he does a great job. Yeah, so Benny, if you're out there, we love you, and yeah. We'll, we'll catch up with those uh, re food reviews at some point. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So how are you doing, Linda? I'm doing great. Yeah? I was not expecting to be here today, yeah. but I actually, by some mishap by of God's circumstances, grace, I, here. I'm here. <laughs> awesome. So, Love it. Yeah. And you needed a partner this morning. Yeah, I did, because sometimes it's hard to do this alone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Monologuing isn't so fun. Yeah, it's like you get those pauses, and I'm like, feel like I'm Darth Vader in the mic. <laughs> yeah, I won't demonstrate for you at home. <laughs> yeah. oh. So, we have yeah. a lot going on this week. We do. Well, we this do. month, actually. Yeah, this whole month. Yep. Yep, we just came out of the uh, the women's lunch this yeah. past weekend, we, and uh, Stephanie gave a uh, wonderful testimony. I heard it was awesome. I did too. I heard oh, it was fantastic. Okay. Yeah. I, I wasn't there. I was okay. at a camp, but yeah. yeah, I heard it was awesome. Yeah, very good. So if you if you missed it, I'm sorry, but we let you know last week. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what else we got going on? Well, we've got the outreach ministry is ramping up, getting ready for the spring summer clothing distribution. And that's all exciting. There's a lot exciting. of movement happening. Yep. They're taking donations currently yep. up through... Hmm. You should know. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should I'm know. I'm just messing with you. Um, it's, on, it's on their Facebook feed. Yeah, so if you Check look out at, the Outreach Ministries Facebook page. Yep, Christian Hill Outreach Ministries Facebook page. You'll be able to see everything that they're looking for, everything yep. that they're doing. And you'll be able to sign up to do your shopping. It's yep. free, but it's yep. shopping. Yep. Uh, there's time slots for you to do that in. And you need to get that signed, get signed in for that as well as... You need to, um, if you're looking at volunteering, and we need yeah. 150 volunteers here yeah, to do this. Yeah, 150 volunteers. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. It so takes a lot of hands to make this work. It certainly does. And, and, and it takes a lot of food, too. Right. So yeah. the volunteers uh, spend a lot of time all week long, and we need yeah. to feed them. Yeah. And those uh, people... We like to bless them with food. And yes, we do. We like to see that they're they're being fed as they yeah. serve. Yep. And so, sign up for that as well. You can yeah, see look April for Colson. She's supposed to. You're supposed to wave your hand to April. Oh. No, that's in the Hi, April. <laughs> no, if April, you're at if actually, you're if you're at home, there's a link for that. There is a link for that. Yeah. Um, you can go to christianhill.com/reg. Or go to the Christian Hill Outreach Ministries Facebook page. You can do all of that. And can they also drop that description box? Is it in there as yes, well? Yes, it's in the description okay. box. Oh, good. I like to mention that because yes. I know there's a lot of handy things in there. That's why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And April Colson should be out in the foyer if you're here in person. Yeah, come to second service. She'll have a clipboard. April. She'll be near yeah. the welcome station. If you don't know, um, just ask someone. Someone out there will be able to point you to the right person right. and april would love to Sign coordinate up, yeah. food and, and things like that for the volunteers yeah so it'll be a busy month getting ready for that and it's it will it's be, be yeah. fantastic and we also have a men's breakfast that day as well yes on the 27th so yes. come out to the men's breakfast you can stay and help with the clothing drive. Yeah. Make, make a day of it, you know? Right. That's going to be 7.45 a.m. for the men's breakfast. <laughs> yes, it is. We, which is we the normal early. Time. Yeah, that's the normal time, but it's always the, uh, unless otherwise stated, it's the fourth Saturday of the month. Right. Just like right. the women's lunch is the second Saturday of every month. Yep. Yep. Hopefully I put up the right fingers. <laughs> I used I to be a catcher, so I used to be able to do that quick, but... <laughs> yeah, so it's it's awesome. We're going to have a lot of fun this yeah. month. We're going to, spring is here finally. It's oh, the weather is getting nice. Get nicer. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the buds are coming out on the trees. Yeah, you it's know nice. what else is coming out? The bugs. The little gnats. Yeah, yeah, They're I terrible. noticed that, yeah. 
Yeah, they're like flying. Yeah, yeah. Little, they get in yeah. your face. They yep. get, uh, they're everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was on campsite this last uh, yesterday, actually, still. Yeah. And uh, the gnats are everywhere. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But the warm weather's coming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And that's the part I that's like. That's the part we all like, I think. Yeah. The longer days, sunshine. Mm-hmm. Hopefully it'll be sunny on weekends instead of raining every yes. weekend. Yes. <laughs> yes. I know last summer, like every weekend. Every it Saturday yeah. rained. Yeah. Oh, we should give a little shout out to uh, to Larry as well because he's not going to pop his head in today. Right. Larry so and Donna We should are have like a little, a little Larry head where we can pop, we the, should. We can pop the head we in. We should. It just comes right in behind you. you know? and yeah. Someone yeah. can stick him in with a, you know, a popsicle stick or something yeah, behind yeah, you. Like a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. We, we have the food pantry to talk about as well. Right. They just, are looking for snacks. Snacks, yeah. That, and I think that's why I was thinking of Larry, because I was thinking oh, of the snacks. Oh, okay. You know, Larry always has a lot of snacks. He does. So, yeah. Yeah, so we... The number of times that he's gone to a dollar store and just loaded up on snacks is yeah, so it's fun to watch. There are plenty of those stores around here where you can pick up plenty of snacks, bring them here to the church, drop them off in the bin right near the elevator, and uh, fill up the food pantry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They've been serving a lot of people lately, so yeah, yes, a lot of people that need it. Yeah, it's been a busy busy month for that as well. So, yeah. yeah, and I know we ramped up for it, but, you know, continue to keep bringing those uh, food donations. Hi, Dave. Hi, Dave. Here's Elder Dave. <laughs> Elder Dave is taking the place of Larry today. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> we should have had him holding the Larry head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Such a blessing. So yeah. awesome. So cool. Yeah, so, um, yeah. So the, I was just looking at this food pantry thing. So, um, yeah, throughout the month of March, we were able to provide food for 27 adults and 19 children. Yep. So we definitely need to restock. Yeah, yeah it's been busy. Yeah. And it's it's kind of neat. It's kind of neat to uh, see all of that action and the people that want to bless other people. So. Right, yeah. Well, Linda, this has been great. We got to get going, though. We yeah. have a wonderful service ahead. And- yep. Yeah, we're, get, we're glad you joined with us, and uh, check out those links in the description box and uh, to get plugged into the different things we just uh, talked, about. S- talked about, and yep. uh, God bless, and have a great week. Love you guys. Bye-bye. See you next time. worship Jesus together as a family this morning in spirit and truth. He deserves all the glory, all the honor, and all our attention. We speak your name this morning. We sing your name this morning. Good, good God. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus come on church we sing till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope full freedom I speak Jesus Cause we know
Jesus. You know, can we take a second this morning and just do the thing we probably don't want to do and turn and say hi to someone around us? <laughs> well, some of the antisocial people. did it. Come on, there are some people, I just made a joke with Christine, who are like, I don't want to talk to anyone. <laughs> Not you, Curtis, we know. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, let's reel it in. But you know, it's okay to have fun in the house of the Lord. 
We are a family. Hi! Where's the baby? Oh, okay. All right, let's get back to worship. God, we could do this all day. Stay later. Okay, anyway. Um, yeah, that was a great start. Good morning, Christian Hill. Oh, man. Yesterday, I didn't even really have a plan this morning what to say. I'm like, I'm just going to follow the Lord's leading. But yesterday, I spoke at the women's um, lunch. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, no, I don't need that. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, like, I don't like talking. And it's so funny what God does. Like, I didn't like singing in front of people, talking in front of people. None of it. But look what God did in my life. Like, really? And so I had to talk yesterday and they, they said, oh, you have 20 minutes. And I'm like, that's a lot. Like, how am I going to fill it up? Guess how long I talked? <laughs> Almost 40. I'm like, wow. And I, and I even like held back from saying a few things. But if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. <laughs> so let's worship our God in spirit and truth because he deserves all of it, doesn't he? And he is our living hope. He is the King of Kings and he is the Lord of Lords. Let's worship him this morning. You know what I think just happened? It was me. Because I thought we were going into living hope, but we're not. That's why I said that. We're actually going into the Lamb, the Lion, the King. This is quite a day. <laughs> was it you? Oh, it was Dave. It wasn't you. Okay, <laughs> we all mess up. It's all right. Here we, here we go. That was really me because I'm like, oh, he's our living hope, but no, we're, he is. Here we go. Here we go.
Who could imagine? 
you're thankful for what he's done for you in your life how we set you free
Wow, don't stop. Praise the Lord. Oh, my goodness. You all have the joy of the Lord today? Oh, my goodness. How can you not? Oh, this morning I want to share some things that happened this past week. It's been a tough week at Christian Hill, but it's been a good week. I had the uh, awesome honor of attending the deacons meeting uh, Thursday night. It was awesome. And that this, they, uh, they talk about all you guys and how good you're doing and how they're ministering to you. They work hard. And uh, that was all done with. And then Professor Bruce and Tammy say, okay, bring out the homework. I'm saying, what? I am not prepared. So Joe was sitting next to me. He said, here's the homework. I said, I'm going to have to cheat, bro. But as each deacon shared their heart on a word study they were doing on joy, it just blessed my heart. And at the time, it ministered to me. So, I like to share some of my findings. The homework's a little late, but here it is. (laughs) The definition of joy. The emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. Someone or something greatly valued and appreciated. So I like to pick this apart a little bit. Someone that is greatly valued is my Lord and Savior. That gives me joy. something that's greatly appreciated is the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life that brings me joy does it bring you joy tell him in John 15 Jesus said I am the vine you are the branches If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. He feeds, we are the branches, all you all are branches. And he feeds us through the vine. We stick close to him is what this says. We're going to be okay. That brings me joy. John 15 11 says, Jesus said, I told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Is your joy complete? You trust in him? Before we partake, let's just remember what he did for each and every one of us. Let's take a moment and go over that in our hearts. Just give it to them. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He gave thanks. He said, this is my body. Let's partake. In the same manner, he took the cup, which represents his spilled blood 
for all mankind. You're all part of mankind. Let's partake. Father God, we just thank you for the opportunity to come before you to put our hurts, hang-ups, and habits on the table so we can hear your word this morning. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I'm grateful we can be together this morning. Amen. It's always good to come together, be uh, transformed by the renewing of our mind together. It's wonderful. Well, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, we want to rejoice over that. You're here because God wants you here. God has a purpose for your being here in our, our heart Our prayer is that God would reveal that purpose to you this morning, but we would ask you to allow us the privilege of rejoicing over your visit with us. Behind some of the chairs, there are some cards. If you grab one of those cards and fill it out at the end of service, you can head out to our welcome station, which is in the foyer, and um, see one of our awesome deacon couples, Bruce and Tammy Rains, who will greet you and trade you that card for one of our coffee mugs. You make sure you leave with something in your hand today. And of course, if you're joining us for the first time online, let us know where you're joining us from as well. And I got to do it. Tyler and Maggie are here and, and, and baby Isla, right, here. I, I got to do it. I can't not do it. I, I'm going to be thinking about it the whole time. So hello. All right. Hello. Hello. Welcome. It's so awesome to see you guys. Um, All right, now that I've thoroughly embarrassed you. um, We have our um, spring and summer clothing distribution coming up on Saturday, April 27th. Um, Yes, amen. It's from 9.30 to 1 p.m. You can sign up uh, for that if you want to have a spot reserved for you so you want to come and um, shop in that way. Remember, we use the word shop. Everything is free. Um, There's You just come and be blessed. Come and be blessed. Now, this event reaches a very um, large amount of people in our community. Like I said last week, I believe our last one was 1,006 people were clothed at our last clothing distribution. So there's a huge impact. And of course, you hear a number like that, it doesn't happen by accident. Um, It doesn't happen just because. It happens because people... In our congregation, we come together, and we, um, we do this together. So there are still some needs, and I was talking with Michelle this morning, and I said, Michelle, you know what's going to happen, right? You know, we'll have some spaces open on the sign-up, but everyone's going to show up, right? But can we help give our outreach director some peace and sign up, and not just show up <laughs> to help out? He can help out all week There's spaces available for you to sign up to help. Um, You can help by bringing food. All of our volunteers need to eat during this time. So you can see April Colson for that. And there's ways for you to sign up. You can scan the back of the chairs, the QR code. That link will pop right up. And uh, if you have any questions, make sure you DM us or just ask us. And we'll link you up with the right people. Well, I have um, two pieces of uh, regretful news uh, to share with, with us this morning. Um, we need to be um, in prayer alongside um, the Lynch family as Tiffany uh, lost her sister, Sherry, um, this past week. And, um, you know, the family is, is there in California. They're grieving um, right now. So we want to come alongside them in prayer and lift them up in this season to so make sure we do that. Um, but it's also with, with great regret and a heavy heart that I have to announce to us the, that our, our uh, faithful brother in the Lord, Daryl Triggs, went to be with Jesus this past week as well. Daryl was a, was a great man. He loved, 
his church family. Didn't he? If you knew Daryl, you knew that. He let you know. He will always had an encouraging word, amen? If you knew Daryl, and he wouldn't let you not have an encouraging word. Yeah, that's it. He, he, was, he was a very positive man. And uh, we'll miss him. But we know where he is. Amen. Amen. He's with the Lord now, and, and that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. But, of course, there's grief. And so we want to pray with uh, the Triggs family and with the Mott family and all those um, in the extended family that have been impacted by the passing of, of Daryl, um, Louise, his wife, I'm praying for you and all the, the kids here. And we love you guys. And if you want to rejoice over um, the life and memory of our brother Daryl, um, his celebration of life service will be here on Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. Um, there are other service details that so you can check out our um, Facebook page with the timing of the, the, the wake and the other details regarding those two days. But if you want to put that in your calendar, the celebration of life service will be here. We can rejoice over the life of our brother. He's a good man. He's a good man. Why don't we pray? Father... In a world um, still tarnished and uh, broken because of sin, there's grief, grief over the the death of our brother Daryl. Thank you, God, that while there's grief here, though, on the earth, there's rejoicing in heaven. We don't have to wonder about that. Daryl let everyone know who he placed his faith in. If you, Lord, thank you that if if anyone ever met Daryl, then we knew immediately where his trust was. Thank you, God, for that faithful witness. Just pray, Father, for the family that as they grieve, thank you that they don't grieve like those without hope. But in the midst of their grief, I pray you would pour out a supernatural sense of peace on them. Lord, thank you that you're you're with us in our time of grief. Thank you, Father, that we have a Savior who grieved, grieved at the grave of, of Lazarus. He knows what grief is. Thank you that we can come to you in our time of need and the time of grief. We pray for the Lynch family as well, Lord God, in their time of grief. Thank you that you are with them, that you are their ever-present help. Thank you, God, that Sherry is rejoicing with you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, that um, you are good even when the things around us are not good and when life doesn't feel good, you are good. And we rejoice over that goodness this morning. And as we come to you in your word, God, thank you that you promise us that your word doesn't return void. It accomplishes the purpose for which you send it out. You have a purpose for your word this morning, Lord. And we want to submit ourselves to that. Father, I pray you would soften our hearts where we need conviction. Father, I pray you would bring conviction. Where we need encouragement, Father, I pray you would bring encouragement. And in all things you would receive the glory that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds and leave this place rejoicing in newness of life for what you have for us today, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, today, um, we are continuing through our Kingdom Culture series. And um, we're going to talk about a topic uh, today that I personally find quite challenging. You know, all of us find different things challenging for different reasons. It's so funny sometimes. I was, uh, it was a couple days ago, 
And our youngest daughter, um, Searsha, was struggling. She was finding something really challenging. She was putting all of her effort into opening a glue stick. <laughs> she just couldn't do it. This glue stick would not open. And she's, you know, I mean, she's grunting. She's turning red, eyeballs popping out, the whole thing. So she comes to me and she says, Daddy, can you help me? So now is my moment, you know, coming as the hero. So I open that glue stick. <laughs> you know, what was, what was simple for me was challenging for her. It's because in of that particular area, she's just like underdeveloped in her strength there, you know. And we all have those places where we're just underdeveloped for whatever reason. We have, we have need to grow in certain areas and places. And this, honestly, what we're going to talk about today is one of those areas of challenge for me. I feel like there are some people, like this is a glue stick <laughs> for me. And... Um, it's because I, I grew up, and I'll tell you, tell you what that is in a second, but I, I grew up having to hustle or feeling like I had to hustle, feeling like I couldn't, like, like every moment had to be spent advancing. I had to get out of where I was. I had to get to the next thing. I didn't have enough. Like, I always felt like I had to hustle, and I carried that right on into adulthood, well into adulthood. And so I never really, even in my early years of my walk, I never really developed a sense of what it means to rest. That's what we're going to talk about today, rest. I never really de developed a sense of what it meant to do that consistently. Not until relatively recently. You know, I know what it is to overwork. I know what it is to ignore the warning signs of being burnt out. I know what it is to explain away the impact that those things have on my relationships. And I know how to explain away the impact of how burnout impacts my own spiritual life. I'm well versed in that the, the truth is, the reason I, 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 I struggle in, in, in this area of rest is because I was just underdeveloped in it. I was underdeveloped in an area that I now believe is crucial. This is a crucial spiritual discipline, and it lies at the heart of living our lives God's way. Remember, we're in our Kingdom Culture series Kingdom culture is living our lives God's way. This lies at the heart of it. This is one of those baseline areas that we need to get, and it's the area of rest. So today, I want to talk about what I'm going to call the principle of the Sabbath. The principle of the Sabbath. I want to talk about both its objective and subjective elements. The principle of the Sabbath, and Lord willing, uh, we'll see this. This is what, Lord willing, we'll see today. That kingdom rest, the kind of rest we're supposed to have as kingdom citizens, his kingdom people on this earth, kingdom rest is two things. It's persistent and consistent. I'll explain what I mean by those in a few moments. Kingdom rest is persistent and it's consistent. Let's talk about that first word, persistent. Persistent means to endure. It, it, it means to last even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of pressure. How can rest endure? How can we say that as kingdom citizens, our rest is persistent? Well, we, we have persistent rest, not because of what we do, but because of who we rest in. That's the first thing we have to talk about here. Who do we rest in? Not how do we experience rest, but who do we rest in? That's the first question. I want to invite us to uh, Matthew chapter 11, um, verses 28 
through 30. Um, Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. This is what Jesus says. You might recognize some of this here. It's a, one, of, one of those very common, well-known verses, but we're going to unpack it a little bit together. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's, let's break this out a little bit. Let's look first at the invitation. There's an invitation here. Did you see it? Come to me. Come to me. There's, there's an invitation that Christ gives us. It's an invitation to relationship with him. Come to me. And who's that invitation extended to? Come to me, all you really religious people who do everything perfectly. <laughs> Is that what yours says? If that's what yours says, we'll give you a new Bible when you leave. Please leave that one at your seat. <laughs> who are the invited? Come to me, all. How many does that leave out? None. All. All. Who labor, labor here is, uh, it means to work with draining effort. Who labor and who are heavy laden. Heavy laden is the idea of having a load that's placed upon you. A burden on your shoulders. <clears throat> now in the immediate context here, what's this labor and load? Well, <clears throat> tell you in a second <clears throat> when I can talk. Here we go. You guys all wanted to hear that. Here we go. What's this labor and load? Well, in the immediate context, it's those that are crushed by the burden of this unrelenting religious legalism that's been imposed on them by the scribes and the Pharisees. It's a load. No one can Bear The labor and the toil is the people striving after peace with God. There's like, there's this relational peace with God that everyone's striving after. But the burden they bear to get there is too great for them to ever reach it. So what's the result? Everyone who, who, who experiences this this pressure of needing to find peace with God, but being unable to find that peace. You're invited. You're invited to something. You're invited to come to Jesus. You're invited into relationship with him. And what's the result of that? I will give you rest. It's rest. Now, what kind of rest? He tells us it's rest for your soul. That's right, that's that good rest. <laughs> it's, it's a rest we experience in our innermost being. It's a ceasing from the striving of trying to be right with God or brought to peace with him in a way that we can never achieve, we can never accomplish. It's soul rest. This is what the yoke imagery is all about. A, a yoke was a wooden bar harnessed to the, to the necks of a pair of oxen. And so to train younger oxen, uh, farmers would yoke them to older oxen. And basically this yoke would be the instrument and means by which the, the, the plowing and whatnot got done. And, and what the Jews had done, the, they were under the heavy yoke of legalism. Their yoke was heavy. They were heavy laden. They were burdened. They had a weight on their shoulders of all of this legalism. And what Jesus invites them to do, Jesus invites everyone to take his yoke, put that yoke down, take a different yoke. And by taking on his yoke, we become connected to him. He's the partner 
in this yoke relationship. We become connected to him. We become guided by him. He's the one who's doing the heavy lifting. He's the one who's pulling the plow. And when we accept Jesus Christ by faith and we're connected to him as his disciples, we get rest. Why? Because of who he is and what he's doing. We become connected to him, yoked to him. He's bearing all the weight. When we come to Christ, we receive the peace with God that we're looking for. We experience that peace with the reality of soul rest. It's a ceasing from striving. It's an eternal rest. It's a rest that we're all made for. But it's a rest that we're born lacking. But it's a rest you can have. And you might be in here this morning restless. Soul restless because you've been striving, feeling that there's, there's, there's something off, there's something missing, there's something wrong. You, you feel disconnected from, from a God you haven't met yet. You, you know he's out there. There's got to be more to life than this, but everything you try to add in there, it doesn't give you the rest that you're looking for because it can't give you the rest that you're looking for. The only thing that can give you that rest is the yoke of the Savior. It's the only thing that can bring you that rest. And he wants you to have that rest. He invites you into relationship with him this morning so you can experience that rest. You might be restless this morning. You can experience soul rest by coming to Jesus Christ by faith. There was a man who, who lived in the uh, 300s and 400s um, AD. You might have heard of him before. He's by the name of Augustine. And Augustine has a work called Confessions. This is Confessions. And he said this in his confessions, and it's so true today. He says this, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. There's nothing that we can add by way of this world that will bring rest to our souls. It's the only place to find true rest. Everything else, it doesn't matter how good the rest is, how many breaks you take, how many vacations you take, how many places you go to, how fresh the air is when you breathe in. All of it's temporary. It's all fleeting. But his rest lasts forever. His rest is persistent. It endures it persists because the source of that rest is Christ. He's the one who gives that rest. And because he lives forever and we are found in him, the rest he gives cannot and will not ever go away. It persists. But what can go away, what we can lose, is our subjective experience of that rest. The objective reality is we have rest in Christ. We, we have peace with God, and being at peace with God, there's no more striving in order to be at peace with God because that peace has been obtained by Jesus Christ and applied to our account. There's a ceasing there. We have that rest, but what can be lost is the experience of that rest in this life. We can live in such a way that the rest we truly have in Christ is seldom experienced and felt. That happens when we do not engage in consistent rest. There's persistent rest. That's who we rest in. We rest in him. We have that rest. That's a reality for us. But we need something else. We need consistent rest so that we can live in the reality and the experience
experienced reality of our persistent rest. God doesn't want us to have that rest in Christ and then live anxious lives with no rest in them. By his grace, God provides not only persistent rest in Christ, but he provides the means by which we can have consistent rest from the labor and work of this life. We experience in this life. And that's the Sabbath. Now, much like the tithe, we talked about the principle of the tithe last week. Much like the tithe, the Sabbath is something that is codified in the law, but it has as its basis a principle that's being formalized in the law. We, we have to understand that that which is codified in the law, there's a principle there. I want to I I look at this. I want to spend basically the rest of our time together looking at Exodus chapter 20. Verses 8 through 11. And really look at the heart of the Sabbath here. I want to look at the heart of the Sabbath. In this text, the Sabbath has three features. The first, and this is going to be found in verse 8, is that the Sabbath is a directive. It's, it was established for the people of Israel as a matter of law. For the people of Israel. Exodus 20, verse 8, says this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is a call for the people of Israel to set apart the seventh day of the week to rest from their labors. It was not a suggestion for them. It was a command to them. In Israel, willful violation of the Sabbath could result in the death penalty. You can find that in Exodus chapter 35, verse 2. So this was meant to be taken very seriously by the nation of Israel. It was a directive to them. But in the New Testament, we see something a little bit different. We see something a little bit different. In the New Testament, the other nine commandments of the Ten Commandments are mentioned in some way as connected to Christian living, but the, but the Sabbath is never mentioned as a directive to the church. Even in places where the context would call for that, I'm thinking of Acts 15. Remember in our series through Acts, you can go check out our sermons on this, but in Acts uh, chapter 15, when the Jerusalem Council is dealing with the idea of whether or not Gentiles need to become Jewish in order to become Christian, and they, 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 they come to their, their established perspective on that and then send it out to the church in Antioch, to the Gentile churches, there's nothing about the Sabbath there. It's all about God's moral law and idolatry, but it's not about the Sabbath. There's no Sabbath. That would have been the perfect place for the Sabbath. But it's not there. In fact, what we see, not only is there an absence of command, there's actually scripture that tells us that the keeping of the Sabbath on a particular day was a matter of conscience rather than law when it came to the church. Let's look at a couple of these scriptures. This is important to establish here because I think in order for us to really get at the principle of the Sabbath, we have to deal with the law, right? So, so what's the transition in law here? Well, we see this uh, in a couple of places. Romans chapter 14, verse, verses five in the first part of verse six says this. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor to the Lord. Now, in this context, in the context of Romans chapter 14, Paul's dealing with matters of personal conviction that we all need to be gracious toward one another with. And one of those matters of personal conviction is the esteeming of a particular day. And given the context of this and, 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 and the book of Romans, 
uh, most commentators understand this particular day to be referring to the Sabbath day, and I, I'm in agreement with that. That there are those in the church that are esteeming that day, and there are those who are not. There are Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. They come from different backgrounds, with different cultures and areas of importance, and what Paul is saying is it's a matter of conscience. Each one needs to be convinced in their own mind. We also see, he says something else in Colossians chapter 2 that highlights another important aspect of this. This is Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, right? That would be the aspects of Jewish law limiting, you know, uh, establishing clean and unclean foods, limiting what they can eat. Or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. Notice what he says, let no one pass judgment on you for these things. Why? These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. See, the reality is that we experience soul rest in Christ. The physical rest was a shadow of the soul rest that we have in him. The writer of Hebrews spends some time on this. I'd invite you to read Hebrews chapter 4 and really dissect that. You can check out our morning devotion series that we did through Hebrews um, if you want a little bit more on Hebrews 4. But there's a Sabbath rest for the people of God, the writer of Hebrews says. And where is that Sabbath rest found? It's found in Christ. It's not found in a day. It's not found in the law. It's found in Christ. So we're not under judgment we're not to place ourselves under the judgment of anyone for not, for not following the Sabbath the way the Jews did. It's no longer a directive. It was a directive to the nation of Israel. It's no longer a directive. It's left as a conviction. So now, here's the question. Just because we're not bound to it as a directive of the law like the Jews were, does that mean that the principle behind the law does not apply to our lives? Is that what that means? Well, to answer that, we have to understand the other features of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not just a directive. It's not just an end unto itself. Even in the giving of the Sabbath as law, we see two other features that help us understand the principle of the Sabbath. That the Sabbath is both protective and reflective. It's not just a directive. It's protective and reflective. It's protective. How is the Sabbath protective? Well, the Sabbath protected people from overworking and from being overworked. You can see that here in Exodus 20, 9 and 10. Look at this. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. The, the word uh, translated here, you shall labor. La the labor there means to expel uh, energy, doing what you have to do. Labor is inherently draining, right? It's inherently draining. But then he says, and do all your work. This is a different word. All your work here, this has to do with occupational work. This isn't just that which drains you. This is your occupation. It's that which you're expected to do occupationally. That means even if you enjoy the work, even if you love it, he's saying you need to rest from it. Why? Why? Why, Why not just the things that are draining? Why? That which is draining from you and also your occupational work. Well, why? why? Why this broad idea? Well, God is protecting the people. God protects the people from themselves. Notice he says, on it, on the Sabbath, you shall, you shall not do any work. 
So, so the Sabbath is something that's supposed to be willfully, personally accepted and followed by the individual. The Sabbath is there to provide you rest, to provide you rest and, and, and a respite so that you don't overwork yourself. Now, why would someone do that? You might be saying to yourself, I ain't trying to overwork. I'm trying to underwork, right? <laughs> but look, people overwork all the time. Raise your hand if you've ever found yourself overworking yourself. Come on, we need some honest people here this morning. All right. Why would we do that? Well, there's a lot of reasons. We might be overworking ourselves because money is our God. And let, let, let me tell you this right. Let me tell you this real quick. You don't have to be wealthy for money to be your God. Money is a, a slave driver. You might work seven days a week trying to get that money and have none of it. That love of money might be driving your overworking. Money might be your God. What else might drive our overworking? Some people mask their insecurities in their work. I don't want anyone to think I'm lazy, so I'm going to work seven 15-hour days this week. Who cares? That's crazy. If you have to work seven 15-hour days so that that person over there doesn't think you're lazy, that's his problem. That person needs to deal with whatever's going on in there. <laughs> that person needs to deal with that. But sometimes we, we mask our own insecurities through our work. Sometimes we, we overwork to find fulfillment. We're trying to fill that void, right? We have this void and we're, we're trying to find something that will fit in there. And we think if we can just advance or get this goal accomplished or get this title or get this award or get this bonus or whatever it might be, we'll find a sense of fulfillment. Sometimes we overwork to hide or to run away. We don't want to deal with what's going on at home. We don't want to, I don't even want to go there. Right? So what do we do? We hide in our work. And so so what God is doing here, in the establishment of the Sabbath, he's protecting people from themselves. Whatever would, what, it doesn't matter what would drive them to overwork, to, to make the choice to overwork. He's protecting them from that. But he's not only protecting people from themselves, he's protecting people from each other. Notice that the text says, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. See, not only, right, is the individual called to rest, everyone that that individual may have authority over or may see himself to have authority over, they're protected from that individual overworking them. The children. Son, you need to work seven days this week because I'm going to keep the Sabbath. And you have to listen to me because you're my child. No, you don't get to do that. You don't get to do that. Servants, I'm going to take my Sabbath rest. You have to keep working. No, you don't get to do that. You, your, your children get rest. Your servants get rest. The animals get rest. Even people outside of the covenant. You don't get to say, oh, you're not in covenant with God. So you don't get the blessing of his rest. You don't get to say that. God is protecting people from each other with the Sabbath. So the, the Sabbath protected people from themselves and protected people from each other. The Sabbath stopped people from overworking and for, from being overworked. That's the principle behind the law. The law was not an end unto itself. I believe that's what Jesus was getting at. In Mark chapter 2, Verse 27, Jesus had just been criticized, right, for allowing his disciples to pluck heads of grain in their hunger. And, and before declaring himself as Lord of the Sabbath, this is what Jesus says. This is Mark chapter 2, 27. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. See, the Pharisees had it backwards, 
Jesus was realigning their thinking. The Pharisees forgot the principle. They were so consumed with the directive, they forgot the principle. They actually made the law of the Sabbath something that was putting more of a burden on the people on the Sabbath than working would have put on them. Jesus realized their thinking. The Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Why is the Sabbath made for man? Was it, how is it made for man? Well, the Sabbath is meant to protect you from overworking and to, from being overworked. That's the principle behind the Sabbath. That still very much applies to us. God still cares. Do you imagine if God was like, well, now that you've found your true Sabbath rest in Christ, please work seven days a week, 15 hours a day, and be burnt out all the time. The Sabbath is protective. But it's also reflective. The Sabbath reflects God's creative design. Look at verse 11, Exodus 20, 11. For, for there means like because, do this for this reason that I'm about to tell you. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day, Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. They were called to the Sabbath as a reflection of the reality that God rested on the seventh day. Sabbath reflects God's design. When we practice the principle of the Sabbath, we become living embodiments that God orders our lives and that we want to be like him, not like the world, not like our idols, but God. The world don't stop. And, and if you follow the world, you want to be just like the world, you'll get burnt out real quick. Your idols will continually drain you. They'll take more and more and more from you. They will never give you what they promise to give you. God is not like that. We don't want our lives ordered by the world or ordered by our idols. We want our lives ordered by God. And the Sabbath is reflective of God's design. He worked and then he rested. So he calls us to work and then rest. Ordering our lives around his design. That's kingdom culture, organizing our lives around God's design. So although the, for the people of Israel, the Sabbath was a directive, in principle, it was both protective and reflective. And so even though it's not a directive for us, even though it's not a directive for the church, it's, it's not binding on the church, even though it's not a directive for us, in the same way, the principle still applies. God still cares about whether or not you are overworking or overworking other people or being overworked. God still wants us to order our lives around his design. So how do we do that? How do we carry that principle forward today? As his kingdom people, as his church, how do we live out the principle of the Sabbath? How do we persist? How do we have persistent and consistent kingdom rest? Well, I want to give us six keys for applying the Sabbath. So if you write things down, you're going to want to write these. You're like, Pastor Chris, you're just getting to your points now? <laughs> Hoped you packed the lunch. All right. No, these, these will, having said all of that, having unpacked the, the scriptures themselves and, and walked through the scriptures, how do we apply it? Well, the first key for applying the Sabbath is you got to be decisive. Be decisive. Choose a day to cease from your labor, to cease from your work. For many, that's going to be Sunday. It's today. For many here, that's today. Keep that. Be decisive that, that, is, that this is your day. But for many, it's never going to be Sunday. Sunday is not a rest day for me. I, we understand that, right? Yeah. Where it's like, all right, this, this, is, this is work. 
right? This is hard, right? This, there's, this is draining. This, and it's good. I praise the Lord. But like, this takes a lot out of you, right? Bearing the burden of ministering the word of God is a heavy one to bear. So Sunday is not my day. It's got to be a different day. We have to be decisive on that day. Have a day. Do whatever you can to have a day. You're not meant to labor seven days a week. You will burn out. You are a, hu a human being, not a human doing. I know we've heard that before. But it starts with the decision. This is where I struggled the most. I just figured, well, I'll rest when it comes. If that's what you do, you will never rest. It's not gonna happen. I'm gonna tell you this right now. It's not gonna happen. You will find yourself laboring and working seven days a week, 15 hours a day. You'll get burnt out. Your relationships will suffer. Your spiritual life will suffer. You gotta be decisive. All right, so be decisive. And then you gotta be specific. Remember Exodus 29 in the first part of verse 10 said, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. So you've got to be specific. What is work? What is labor for you? What is it? And it's, you've got to ask that question. I mean, yes, we're talking about your job, but what if you don't have defined work hours? What, what if you're in a salaried position and you just do the work when it comes to you. you. You have to be really specific about what labor is and what labor means. This doesn't mean spend, you know, five or six days on the job site and then on the seventh day go do your side job because that's still labor. I know it's hard because that's what I did. I did it for, I'm not even saying years. I did it for decades. It impacted our relationship. There were weeks, I, weeks in a row, 105-hour work weeks. I'm not making that up. We're not, meant to, we're not meant for that. We're not meant for that. We gotta be specific. You can't rest from your labor unless you define what labor is. Define what labor is for you. And then choose a day to say, no. I will rest. In order to do that, you have to know what labor is. So be specific. Three, be consistent. <clears throat> remember the text says in, ver in verse eight, remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. To keep something holy means to set it apart. Holy, holy is to set something apart. You have to do that. You have to be consistent with that. If you're not consistent, it's never going to happen. I'm saying this as like somebody who's only gotten reasonable at this very recently. This is a challenging message for me. This is one of those messages where I'm like, all right, I'm going to prepare this message. I'll preach it in a year when I'm good at it. No. We got to be consistent. If we're not consistent, it's never going to happen. It's not going to happen on its own. We have to be consistent. But number four, we also have to be flexible. See, there's a difference between setting the day apart and being legalistic. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 12, verses 9 through 14. He went on from there, and it, well, here's what the text says. He went on from there and entered uh, their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? He said to them, Jesus said to them, which of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. The man stretched it out and was restored, healthy like the other, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Talk about missing the point. Right? Like, how do you, you can't even talk to somebody like that. Like, anyway, but, but what's the point of this, right? What does Jesus say? It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. There are going to be days where you're on your Sabbath rest and a sheep falls in a pit. And, and you're going to have to do what you identify as labor to help a sheep. It is less loving to say, sorry, catch you tomorrow. 
than it is to reach down and help a sheep. You've got to be flexible. Don't be legalistic. Sometimes you've got to help a sheep. So be flexible. Two more. Very quick, very quick. I know the hour's getting late. Can I keep going? All right, it was just encouragement for me. I wasn't asking actual permission. All right. Number five, be reasonable. Be reasonable. You know, God still cares about you overworking other people. So much of the way that we treat each other is more informed by the baggage that we have from the way others treated us than it is from the spirit or from the word. And just as much as we need rest, we have to be sensitive to the rest that others need and we have to be reasonable enough to work that into our thinking. We have to be. You know what that means? Parents, let your children rest. Let them rest. I know some people just bristled. Look, just because you were overwhelmed when you were 15 does not mean you need to bring that toxicity into your children's life. I said that right in time for the youth students, right? They came up, didn't plan it that way. Look, yes, our children need to learn ownership. They need to learn responsibility, but not at the expense of biblical principles and not in a way that crushes their spirit. We need to give our children rest. Just because we didn't have it doesn't mean they shouldn't have it. Employers, uh oh. It is unreasonable and unbiblical to expect your workers to work seven days a week. Lose that expectation. Lose it. God forbid we overwork people just because we can. Remember, the Sabbath was made not only to protect us, but to protect others from us. Now, as a man, I'm going to speak to the husbands and to the fathers in the room here. I'm, we're meddling today. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to take this last point that I was going to make, and we're going to actually, this is going to be our sermon next week. Number six will be our sermon next week. I'm going to finish on this. It's easy for us, men, to take for granted the work of motherhood and to make our wives feel like they cannot rest. This is okay for you to agree with me, wives. This is a good. We have to find a way to work into our week time for our wives to get away without the kids. Without them. We got to find a way. We got to find a way. Right? <laughs> They're planning right now. <laughs> They're hatching it up right now. We have to do that. I can't ever hear anything up here. I don't know what, any, what just happened. But look, and, and here, here, I'm going to call the, the, the team to come back up. Like I said, we're going to table this last point. I'm going I'm I'm to focus this here. But let me say this. Let me say this. Let me say this. Men, I, I need to, to say this to us. When we are, when we are being reasonable and making sure there's space for our wives, for the mother of our children to have rest, do not say that you are babysitting your kids. Amen. Men? Let me tell you what that feels like to, to your wife. That feels like, that, that feels like it's her job to watch children and it's your job to live life. That's what it feels like. That's what you're saying. And it also reflects more of our own culture's degradation of the family. Our culture's destroyed the principle of the family, the reality of the family. And when we say, men, we babysit our kids, what we are saying is, they're over there, I'm over here, and I'm just like the person I hire, you know, on this day. No, you don't babysit your kids. Here's, I'll give you another vocabulary word to use instead. You're 
being a father. You're not babysitting. You're being a dad. Dad. Man, we got to do that. And mothers, it might take a lot of internal work, but don't feel guilty for needing time to yourself. Don't feel guilty. All right, we're going to table this last point. Would you stand with me? I guess we know what next week's sermon is going to be about. <laughs> if you want to get meddled with a little bit more. Woo! Yes. All right, yes. we, need to, we need to close. We need to close. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come on up. Look, if, if the Lord spoke to you this morning, if God was poking at you a little bit, the principle of the Sabbath, he wants us to rest. He wants us to rest. He wants us to be protected from ourselves and from others. He doesn't want us to overwork. He wants our lives ordered around him. Pick a day. Be reasonable with it. Pick a day. Be, spe- be decisive. Be specific. Be consistent. Be flexible. Be reasonable. Like, like make this important. Or Let's order our lives around his design. That's what kingdom culture is living our lives God's way. And the principle of the Sabbath, apply it to our lives. We'll keep our week centered around him. Amen? Amen. All right, so if you need prayer for anything, anything that was said today, God revealed something to you and you need prayer, would you come on up? We'll pray for you. You want to accept Christ today? Find that rest in him. We'll pray for you. You should come on up now. I'm going to pray. We're going to close. Father, thank you for your grace. Oh, Lord. Thank you, God, for your mercy. Thank you, God, that you want us to rest. You want us to have rest in Christ and rest from our labors. Lord, I pray that we would respond to your heart in this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
Great Sunday, and we will see you next week.